Session 20, Matrimony, our hymn, May the Grace of Christ. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O God, grant us a spirit of wisdom and insight to know you clearly. Enlighten our innermost vision, that we may know the great hope to which you have called us, the wealth of your glorious heritage to be distributed among the members of the Church, and the immeasurable scope of your power in us who believe, who our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God for ever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel, according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. The Pharisees approached Jesus and asked, is it lawful for a husband to divorce his wife? They were testing him. He said to them in reply, What did Moses command you? They replied, Moses permitted him to write a bill of this divorce and to dismiss his wife. But Jesus told them, Because of the hardness of your hearts, he wrote this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, no man, sorry, no human being must separate. In the house, the disciples again questioned him about this. He said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So our subject today is matrimony, and the second, the first two lines in the second stanza express so well what our aim is. So may they abide in union with each other and the Lord. Many years ago, Bishop Fulton Sheen wrote a book entitled Free to Get Married, pointing out that it's not just the two, but married in Christ. And that is our subject today. Archbishop Michael Miller gave the priests of the Archdiocese a book this Christmas. And the book expresses very well what 
the evils in our society are. It says, every human society possesses, with more or less strength, a moral and spiritual vision, a set of assumptions and a way of looking at things that is largely taken for granted rather than argued for. These fundamental assumptions, the book says, provide the atmosphere the society's members breathe and the soil in which the society's institutions take root and grow. Such a vision is holistic, a way of seeing things. We live in such a society today. Well, that's exactly what um, you and I found when we first started teaching our CIA in 1997. We found, if you remember, that we weren't getting through to people on the subject of matrimony. Everything the church said seemed to be opposed to everything that they had absorbed from society. And so we're explaining how, why we came to write the red page. We want to say more or less what Pope Pius XI said at the beginning of his encyclical, Casti Canubi. In order that the deceits of the enemy may be avoided, it is necessary, first of all, that they be laid bare. Since much is to be gained by denouncing these fallacies for the sake of the unwary, even though we prefer not to name these iniquities, yet for the welfare of souls, we cannot remain altogether silent. So we urge you before, if you haven't read the red page, the red pages, I should say, um, stop right now and read them. Read them realizing that they're completely wrong. And as we say at the bottom of page 382, Prepare yourself for something entirely different. God's view of marriage, and he is the one that made it, is so different than the world's. It's interesting in that passage of the gospel, written in the hearts of the, of the, um, the, the, the Pharisees, written in their very hearts, they were trying to test Jesus, but they knew what they were doing was advocating was wrong. Christ said the two shall become one. And it's difficult. This is why the disciples again questioned him. But he emphasized it. If she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. If he divorces her and marries another, he commits adultery. So what the church teaches about marriage Matrimony is a sacrament, the outward sign of God's graciousness, his grace, his help that he gives to us to live out the life he calls us to. Matrimony is a sacrament that sanctifies the contract of Christian marriage and gives God's special help to those who receive it worthily to enable them to bear the difficulties of their state, to love, to be faithful to each other, to bring up their children in the fear of God. Once a sacramental marriage has been consummated, no power on earth can dissolve it. For Christ said, what God has joined together, no human being must separate. From the time that marriage, that the sacramental marriage has been consummated, it is an objective reality. That is, something that exists, whether we know it, recognize it, feel it, or admit it. It is a sacrilege to contract marriage in mortal sin or in disobedience to the laws of the church. And instead of a blessing, the guilty parties draw upon themselves the anger of God. For the marriage of a Catholic to be valid, it must take place in church in the presence of a priest or deacon. Remember that the priest or, and, or deacon 
just call down God's blessing upon the marriage. The marriage itself is entered into by the couple. Matrimony. So we talk now about the first three sacraments, the sacraments of initiation, baptism, confirmation, and the Holy Eucharist. Uh, we've also talked about holy orders. Now we're talking about the other sacrament at the service of communion, matrimony. Matrimony is the sacrament by which a man and a woman establish between themselves a partnership of the whole of life, which by its nature is directed toward the good of the spouses and the procreation and education of offspring. It is one of the two sacraments at the service of communion because it's directed toward the service of others, like holy orders. Like all sacraments, it brings into being the spiritual reality it symbolizes. What is the spiritual reality that matrimony brings into being? To understand the answer, we must consider love in its origin, which is God. God, in his deepest mystery, is not a solitude, but a family, since he has in himself fatherhood, sonship, and the essence of the family, which is love. God is love. His very being is love. He did not have to create in order to have someone to love. His own life is a loving communion of persons. And Scott Hahn puts it beautifully. The Father pours out the fullness of himself. He holds nothing of his divinity back. He eternally fathers or begets the Son. The Father is, above all else, a life-giving lover and the Son is his perfect image. So what else is the Son but a life-giving lover? And he dynamically, actively, images the Father from all eternity, pouring out the life he has received from the Father, offering that life back to the Father as a perfect expression of thanks and love. That life and love that the Son receives from the Father and returns to the Father is the Holy Spirit. So looking at God, we can understand something of love. Now God created humans out of love in order to draw us up into his Trinitarian life of love and thus make us share his bliss. He made both genders. I'm looking at footnote 9. God created, in Hebrew, the word is Adam, meaning man as opposed to animal, like the Latin homo. In Genesis 1, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. In the divine image, he created him. Male and female, he created them. In chapter 2, he created man, but then he said it is not good for the man to be alone. Accordingly, he made a woman whom the man, and now the Hebrew word is man as opposed to woman, a different word completely, whom the man recognized as bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. It's unfortunate in the sense that we use the one word in, English, in two yeah. different ways. Yeah. At the beginning of creation, Jesus said, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall become as one. They are no longer two, but one flesh. A human, then, is an image of God. Not only the God who created and rules the world, but also, and essentially, God who is a divine communion of persons. A human images God not only through his own humanity, but also through the communion of persons formed by man and woman. That communion is more profound than our communion with our father and mother, even though every cell in our body comes from the union of our parents' sperm and ovum. Every single gene in our bodies comes either from our father or from our mother. We are very connected with them, but 
A man is to leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and those two shall become one flesh. And God blessed them, saying, Be fertile and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. On this married couple then, right from the beginning, there descended the blessing of fertility, linked with human procreation. From the communion of a man and a woman, children would proceed. A dim analogy of how God the Holy Spirit proceeds from God the Father and God the Son. Now, because God made us in his image, he wrote into our nature the vocation or calling, the capacity, and the responsibility of love and communion. Those three words, vocation, capacity, and responsibility, they're such such loaded words, mm -hmm. so important. Love is the fundamental and innate, inborn, vocation of every human being. We are called to love in our integrity or wholeness, our unified totality, body and soul. One way of responding to this vocation is matrimony. It's not the only one. Um, the other one is virginity for the sake of the kingdom of God, which we'll talk about much later in this course. In other words, in the priesthood, we're still called to love. In your unified yes. totality, totality, body and soul. Now, there's lots of evidence that God is a lover. All through salvation history, he expresses his love for us in marital terms. In the Old Testament, he called Israel his bride. I remember the devotion of your youth, how you loved me as a bride, he says. But like a woman faithless to her lover, even so have you been faithless to me, O house of Israel. He tries to win her back, to stop her prostitution with false gods. I will allure her, he says. I will lead her into the desert and speak to her heart. She shall respond there as in the days of her youth, when she came up from the land of Egypt. Then she shall call me my husband, and never again my Baal, which means Lord or Master. Husband, not Lord or Master. What beautiful words those are, husband and wife. God comforts Israel like a wife married in youth and then cast off. For a brief moment I abandoned you, but with great tenderness I will take you back. I will espouse you to me forever. I will espouse you in right and in justice, in love and in mercy. I will espouse you in fidelity, and you shall know the Lord. Here the Hebrew for no is yada. The same as the word used when Adam knew his wife Eve so that she conceived and gave birth. Pope John Paul said, I'm looking at footnote 33, conjugal love leads spouses to the reciprocal knowledge which makes them one flesh. Reciprocal. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we see this all through. First of all, that was in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament. Jesus himself described God's reign in terms of a wedding. It is like a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son, he says, or ten bridesmaids who took their torches and went out to welcome the groom. In the new and eternal covenant that he ratified with his blood at the Last Supper slash crucifixion, Christ betrothed the church to himself as his bride, making her one flesh with him by giving her his body to eat. Then, just as after a Jewish betrothal, he went to prepare a place for her. Eventually, he will return to take her with him, so that where he is, she also may be. Remember that, as we explained in our talk on Mary and Joseph, a Jewish betrothal was a marriage, not like a modern engagement, which can fairly easily be broken. Accordingly, John the Baptist called Jesus the bridegroom, and Jesus accepted the title. 
Paul calls the church Christ's bride. So all through the Old Testament and the New, and at the end of time, finally, John the Evangelist describes heaven as the consummation of this betrothal. I will show you the woman who is the bride of the Lamb, an angel said to him. And he saw the holy city Jerusalem, the church, based on the apostles and whose gates are the twelve tribes of Israel. He saw the holy city Jerusalem, the church, coming down from heaven. He heard the shouts of a great crowd. This is the wedding day of the Lamb. His bride has prepared herself. And last week we noted how often Christ is described as the Lamb, especially in the book of Revelation. Is all this marital language just a metaphor? Simply our attempts to describe God's love in terms we will understand? No. Pope Benedict says, God loves with the love of a person. From all the nations, he chooses Israel and loves her. His love may certainly be called eros. Now, eros is that love between man and woman, which is neither planned nor willed, but somehow <clears throat> imposes itself. God, the absolute and ultimate source of all being, is a lover with all the passion of a true love. And this love finds its definitive fulfillment in Jesus Christ, who is God the Son made man for our salvation. Now we can answer the question we started with. What is the spiritual reality that the sacrament of matrimony brings into being between husband and wife? It is the love Christ expressed when, for us men and for our salvation, he left his Father and came down from heaven. It is the love he expressed when, at the Last Supper, he made us one flesh with him through the Eucharist, in a new covenant ratified by his own blood. It is the love he expressed when, as he hung dead on the cross, the church came forth from his pierced side in blood and water. Pope Francis says, as from, I'm looking at footnote 54, as from the side of the first Adam, after having cast him into a deep sleep, God draws forth Eve, so also from the side of the new Adam, sleeping the sleep of death on the cross, there is born the new Eve, the church. We can imagine Christ saying, like the first Adam, here at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Just as the sacrament of baptism makes us live with divine life, Zoe, so the sacrament of matrimony makes spouses love each other with divine love, specifically the conjugal or marital love between Christ and the Church. Accordingly, this love between spouses, this supernatural love, which is brought into being by the sacrament of matrimony, is exclusive and faithful, for it images the love between Christ and his one bride, the church. It is fruitful, open to the birth of children, just as the love of Christ, between Christ and his church leads to the rebirth of children in baptism. I'm just looking at... at um, Footnote 56, Pope John Paul said, Thus the Church finds in the family, born from the sacrament of matrimony, the cradle and the setting in which she can enter the human generations and where they, in their turn, can enter the Church. Finally, the covenant between spouses is indissoluble, for it makes them one body, one flesh, just like Christ and the Church. Now, many people, Pope Benedict pointed out, many people see fidelity, fertility, and indissolubility as thoroughly negative requirements artificially imposed on eros by the Church. To see how wrong they are, consider sexual intercourse, the characteristic expression of eros. 
It is not purely biological, but concerns the innermost being of the human person, for it symbolizes the total gift of the body. But for this gift to be truly human and not merely animal, it must symbolize the total gift of the person. Therefore, it must be lifelong and total. Neither person can withhold part of it, such as his or her fertility. Neither person can reserve even the possibility of withholding it in the future. And I'm just going to read footnote 63. It may not help you if you're not mathematical, as many people are not, many intelligent people are not. You've probably heard me say that before. But um, when I was doing teacher training in 1974, one of the people teaching me, who, with whom I became quite friendly, was living with a man she wasn't married to. And in the course of discussions, I told her what I thought. She said, well, I don't see that. She said, we are totally committed to each other right now, but we realize it might not last. <coughs> So I gave her an analogy. Total, from, temporary. <laughs> from Well, we laugh at that, but some people think it is yeah. total now, but temporary. Consider this analogy from probability theory. The experiment of throwing 10 dice all at once and recording what numbers come up is held to be equivalent to the experiment of throwing one die 10 times. Failing to throw the one die the tenth time would be equivalent to withdrawing one of the dice from the ten in the first place. So throwing nine out of ten. Analogously, and this is how I put it to this lady, withholding anything of oneself in the future is equivalent to withholding part of oneself now. Hmm. Anyway, yeah. she understood. I don't know if everybody will. <laughs> And this total self-giving is possible only in marriage, the free and deliberate covenant of conjugal love by which spouses publicly commit themselves totally to each other until death. C.S. Lewis points out, to be in love is both to intend and to promise lifelong fidelity. People in love promise it spontaneously. I will love you forever are almost the first words they say to each other, not hypocritically, but sincerely. Genuinely, they mean it, and it seems impossible it could be anything else. Sheldon Van Orken, whom we're going to quote in a minute, says, Lovers make these vows lightly, not because they intend to break them, but because they are convinced they will never wish to break them. So almost when they first meet. Yeah, that's why they talk about love at first sight. Yeah. As a matter of observable fact, then, fidelity, fertility, and indissolubility are natural to Eros. However, in the sacrament of matrimony, they have a new significance, for they become the expression of specifically Christian values, and the Church insists that they be taken seriously. Eros, then, the natural love between spouses can be compared to the supernatural love between Christ and the Church, but only as ghosts can be compared to solid people. You may remember how we used Lewis's uh, imagination from the great divorce when we spoke about supernatural life, um, thinking of natural life as quite ghostly compared to supernatural life. Accordingly, in the same sort of way, Paul uses Christ's love for the church to teach husbands and wives about matrimony, not vice versa. So I'm just going to read some of this and realize he's saying this is how husbands and wives should behave just as Christ has behaved toward the church. Now, some of what he says may be repugnant. If you have become imbued, as many people have, with the world's view of sex and matrimony. This may go against the grain, but and we're going to have we're going to do much more explaining and say much more about it. So try and hear it before we say any more. The husband is head of his wife, not lord or master or boss or superior, 
The husband is head of his wife, just as Christ is head of his body, the church, as well as its saviour. As the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. Husbands should love their wives as they do their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Observe that no one ever hates his own flesh. No, he nourishes it and takes care of it as Christ cares for the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cling to his wife, and the two shall be made into one. This is a great foreshadowing. I mean that it refers to Christ and the church. The sacrament of matrimony brings into being between spouses the very relationship of Christ with the church. Within the unity of the two, a phrase that Pope John Paul II used a great many times, 14 times in his encyclical Mulieris Dignitatum, on the dignity of women. Within the unity of the two, then, the husband is head of his wife, just as Christ is head of his body, the church. The unity of the two. It's a beautiful expression. And within that unity, the husband is head of the wife, St. Paul says, just as Christ is head of the church. To see what Paul means by head, consider something else he said. The head of every man is Christ. The head of a woman is her husband. And the head of Christ is the Father. Now, if God the Father is the head of Christ, who is God the Son, head cannot mean boss or superior. For within the Holy Trinity, none comes before or after. None is greater or inferior, but all three persons are co-equal and co-eternal. Paul then does not mean that a woman's husband is her boss or superior. And neither does God. For speaking of Israel's return to him, he said, Then she shall call me my husband, and never again my Baal, my lord or master. The husband is... Above all, he who loves, while the wife is she who is loved. In the context of the whole of Paul's letter, the wife's submission to her husband means, above all, the experiencing of love. That's from Pope John Paul, part of his Theology of the Body, a general audience in 1982. In fact, if husbands treated their wives as God the Father treats God the Son and Christ treats the Church, no one would object to their headship. If we do, it is because husbands and wives belong to a fallen race. However, we cannot solve the problem by trying to reinvent marriage. Marriage was established by the Creator and endowed by Him with its own proper laws. God himself is the author of marriage. Sheldon and Davy Van Orken, that was her nickname, her real name was Jean, they discovered this for themselves in their profound and lifelong attempt to eliminate headship from their marriage. The two devoted all their minds and hearts to keeping their in-loveness, Van Orken said. When they married in 1937, feminism was simply not on. But he was determined to renounce husbandly authority. They would discuss everything and not act until they agreed, and they would share housework and cooking as well as sailing and boat work, which took up a large part of their life. They all, call, go, all good things. Yeah. yeah. They call themselves comrade lovers, not husband and wife. They gave up everything they could not experience identically, including children. Davy did not demand this in the name of women's rights, Van Orken stressed. It was my initiative done in the name of love. So we're quoting from both of his books here. The first one, 
A Severe Mercy, um, is the story of their marriage. Under the Mercy is his look back at their marriage after Davy's death in retrospect. Both of them were agnostics to begin with, but they began studying Christianity together out of interest, and they soon became convinced of its truth and started going to church. Davy died in 1955 at the age of 40, but Sheldon lived for another 41 years. In 1981, he became a Catholic. The two never consciously changed their minds about marriage, and Van Orken remained an ardent feminist for many decades. But he came to see that before Davy had died, she had been starting to want to be wifely and obedient. I truly believe that she had found it liberating to be a traditional Christian wife, he said. Not a comrade, not a partner, but a wife. Paul's headship means not bossing, he explained, but initiating or leading. There was a certain irony, therefore, in the fact that he had initiated their feminism. He had exercised a sort of headship, which Davy had accepted and even desired without either of them realizing it. How, for instance, in the priesthood, when once the bishop to ask you to do things, <laughs> you know, you want yeah. to serve him, you yeah. want to serve the people. Yeah. Yeah. Van Orken's conclusion was that male leadership is inbuilt in creation. It can be denied, but only at heavy cost to love. He and Davy, loving so deeply, had found it impossible to deny, try as they might. Van Orken, in his second book, also tells of four women who met weekly to study the Bible. One evening they came to Paul's statement that the husband is head of the wife. They paused and read it again. There was a silence. Every one of those women, they all knew it, was the head in her marriage. They regarded their husbands as amiable and no doubt lovable blunderers who couldn't be trusted to think of things and read things competently. They found other similar passages. We've listed them there in footnote 90. Finally, one said, well, girls, what do we do? Another said, we've got to do it. A third said, they've got to, the men. In other words, the men have to take their responsibility. They got their husbands together and talked. Then came the miracle. In less than a year, all four women were telling everyone about it with amazement and delight. Every husband had grown taller in his wife's eyes, bigger, stronger, wiser, more humorous. Each wife felt that her marriage had come to a new depth of happiness, a joy that it had never had before, a rightness. Later, they realized that their husbands had never demanded and never would have demanded the headship. It could only be a free gift from wife to husband. This is what Davy first intuitively understood and then came in the last years of her life to understand more deeply through her beloved St. Paul, the Narkin said. Mm -hmm. Of course, for this miracle to happen, men too must heed St. Paul. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Among the Gentiles, those who seem to exercise authority make their importance felt, Jesus said. It cannot be like that with you. Anyone among you who aspires to greatness must serve the rest. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, to give his life in ransom for the many. The husband is head of the wife, just in so far as he is to her, what Christ is to the church. He is to love her as Christ loved the church, and Christ gave his life for her. Moreover, he did it while we were still sinners, not because he found the church beautiful, 
but because he wanted to make her beautiful. And we strongly urge you to read Appendix 1, Johnny Lingo's Eight Cow Wife, which shows very beautifully, very convincingly. And very how, humorously as well. How love can be beautifying. Yeah. There's also, we'll talk more about it at the end, there's also a book by a woman who, as far as we can tell, may not even be Christian, so she makes a number of mistakes. But she wrote a book called How to Find Peace and Passion with a Man. And by trial and error, she found just about what Davy and Van Auken found. It's very much worth reading. We have it available um, to be uh, to lend, but we've written what we call a Catholic preface to it, pointing out some of the places where she's quite wrong. But in general, it, it it's such a good book and written from somebody's personal experience, which makes it very convincing. Yeah. But there's a lot in there, and and this idea of headship properly understood, is something the world doesn't understand. And many of us have become, both men and women, have become imbued. I think myself, Father, I don't know if you're right, but women who think that women should be, the church should ordain women priests, I think they are seeing the priesthood, which is part of the Petrine dimension of the church, as a position of power, authority, bossing, Instead yeah. of what Christ says here, a position of service. I want to serve. And that's yeah. exactly yeah. what the church says. The Petrine dimension of the church is there in service to the Marian dimension. The sacrament of holy orders is one of the two sacraments at the service of communion. Yeah. There's a lot to think about there, especially, as I say, if... If, you be, if you've been subjected to the world's view of it. So let's take a break there. Still on this point of headship. If the head is not the boss, what does Paul mean by saying, as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to their husbands in everything. In practice, for marriage to be permanent, the family's head must, in the last resort, have the power of deciding the family policy. A permanent association requires a constitution, and in a council of two, there can be no majority. Does a wife, then, have no part or power in family decision-making? Take another look at matrimony's prototype, Christ and the Church. Jesus told his apostles that what they bound or loosed on earth would be bound or loosed in heaven. And he kept his word. The Church, therefore, does have power to absolve sins, to pronounce doctrinal judgments, and to make disciplinary decisions. Accordingly, the apostles could say, after determining that non-Jewish Christians did not have to follow the entire law of Moses, it is the decision of the Holy Spirit and ours too. I love that. How we cooperate yeah. in making decisions and, and doing things. So if the apostles could say that, Paul cannot possibly mean that wives should have no opinions of their own, no part or power in determining family policy. To understand his meaning, you have to realize that decision-making is more, much more, than just making a choice. Beforehand, there is the gathering of factual data and the proposing of creative ideas. Afterward, there is the implementing of the choice and the evaluation of the choice. Influence and power, far from being concentrated solely in the moment of choice, are diffused through all the stages of decision-making. Now, 
this came, this idea of decision making, which was new to me at the time, came from a talk by Father Robert Kennedy. To find the footnote. By Father... 105. 105. By Father Robert Kennedy. He called his talk Shared Responsibility in Ecclesial Decision Making, Church Decision Making. It was a talk delivered in Vancouver in 1995. But it, it clearly refers to all decision making. So we took, simply took out the few paragraphs where he specifically applied it to parishes yeah. and dioceses. Where we were particularly... And just, and just put it in as decision-making. Yeah. Where we were particularly interested in this at that time was parish pastoral councils. You want to hear what the needs of the church are, the parish. You need to know what their ideas are, what their thoughts are, and then you have to finally make a decision. Make a choice. A choice. Once you've... Once, Father Kennedy insisted yes, on that. Yes. yes. Yeah. Decision making involves it's, it's, all five. Yes. It's and the then, choice where everybody thinks the power is. And then be open later to somebody coming in and saying, you know, I think we've made a mistake here. We should go back to that if necessary. Well, I have a good example in my own experience as a teacher. I, I didn't keep track of it, but again and again, I taught for 36 years in the public system. Again and again... We would be told at a staff meeting, usually in September, there's a new policy coming down from the government. It's going to change the whole way you teach. You won't be able to do this. You won't be able to do that. You'll have to do this. You'll have to do that. And of course, every teacher thinks, oh, the work involved. But I can't tell you how many times, as far as I can tell, it came to nothing. As far as I know, we simply did not implement the choice the government had made. It just didn't happen. So where was the power? With us, surely, not with the government. Or something is tried for a little while and then fails and just sort of goes back into yeah. what was done before. So um, we strongly recommend, we seem to, I seem to be using that phrase a lot, but we do recommend that you read that appendix. We've just called it decision-making, shared responsibility in decision-making. And when you read it, you see. And, and you said, Father, too, you had an example. What was it? You were talking about um, how to, where to put the confessionals in the newly redecorated Holy Rosary Cathedral. 1984, yes. We were making some major renovations at the time. And Father Mallon, who is no longer pastor there, he had just given up the pastorship after years, recommended that they be in one place, but he wasn't on the, on the committee. But when they finally made a decision uh, to change it, he came along and said, if you do that, then there's, put the confessionals at the back of the church, they'll get used as bathrooms. Oh. <laughs> we left them right where they had been. Yet he wasn't part of the decision-making, so to speak. Part, no, but he came in with... Gathering factual data yes. and proposing creative ideas. Yes. So they left the confessional. So I'd forgotten what it was. I knew it was something <laughs> like that. Yeah. And he, he also, um, Father Kennedy's got a number of other examples from history. Very much worth reading. Mm -hmm. I should read it again myself. I haven't read it for a couple of years. Husband and wife share responsibility for family policy, not as in a democracy where identical voters cast equal votes, but as in a body, where organs are different yet complementary, and each contributes its own unique gifts. It was a, obviously a wrong number. We should have turned the phone off before we started. Thank you. God gives man and woman an equal personal dignity. Both are persons, man and woman equally so, since both were created in the image and likeness of God. But man and woman are different, just as Christ and the church are different. And the difference is soul deep. Spiritually, not just psychologically or physically, they are as different as a nut and a bolt, which are equally necessary to hold things together. Or a violin and a bow, which are equally necessary to make music, or a lock and a key, 
which are equally necessary to make things secure. But if any part of those is missing, yep. it's useless. Man and woman were made for each other. Not that God left them half made and incomplete, but that he created them to be a communion of persons in which each can be helpmate to the other, for they are equal as persons and complementary as masculine and feminine. Beautiful, yeah. So now let's come back to the sacrament itself. Jesus performed his first public miracle during a wedding feast at Cana in Galilee. In his presence there, the church sees a confirmation of the goodness of marriage and the proclamation that henceforth matrimony will be a sacramental or efficacious sign of his presence. At the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, she officially recognized the institution of marriage as it had been ordained by God from the beginning as one of the seven sacraments. The sacramental sign of matrimony is the consent by which a baptized man and a baptized woman give themselves to each other. I take you to be my wife. I take you to be my husband. Fulfilled or consummated by the marriage act. And I'm just going to read what um, Pope John Paul said about that. He said, in footnote 114, in that sign, sexual intercourse, they transfer the light of truth and beauty expressed in liturgical language, I take you to be my wife, I take you to be my husband, they transfer that to the language of the body. In this way, conjugal life becomes in a certain sense liturgical. I think that's beautiful. The consent is a mental act. The marriage act is a physical act. The sacrament of matrimony is not a contract in which goods are exchanged, but a covenant in which persons are exchanged in their integrity or totality. The sacrament, as Father said at the beginning, is not administered to the couple by a priest or a deacon, but by the man and the woman to each other. The priest is there merely as a witness on behalf of the church. Through the sacrament of matrimony, Christ gives spouses strength to take up their cross and follow. Did I miss a page? Yes, I missed a page. Sorry. I'm going to go back to the top of page 390 for anybody who's following. Both husband and wife must understand that marriage is a permanent partnership between a man and a woman that is ordered to the procreation of children through sexual union. I should point out, I think it's fair to point out that the priest or deacon is not there, just there as a witness, also to call down God's, God's blessing. blessing. Yeah. Yes. So the spouses must understand. They must be free to marry and their consent must be given freely. For example, without coercion, grave fear or serious reservation. Without this freedom, the marriage is null. That is, it does not exist. I remember the first declaration of nullity I ever heard about. Um, I don't know when it was. It must have been, I think, in the early 50s, maybe. But um, the Duchess of Marlborough, after the Duke died, went to the Vatican and said, I married him because my mother said she would commit suicide if I didn't. And the Vatican said, this marriage, what looks like a marriage, is null. That's sort it of was pressure. not. There was not free consent. It was given under coercion, grave fear. Interesting. And that's why the church never claims to annul a marriage. She merely issues a declaration of nullity. After investigation, we find that this was never a marriage. This marriage never took place. It we'll, seems to. But we'll come back to that point. The spouses must have the mental, psychological, and moral capacity for marriage. They must also have the physical capacity for sexual intercourse, which by its nature points toward marriage's dual purpose 
the manifestation of conjugal love, and the procreation and education of children. Once a sacramental marriage has been consummated, no power on earth can dissolve it, for it brings into being between the spouses the indissoluble covenant between Christ and his church. However, if any of the necessary conditions for a sacramental marriage is absent, the church can, after investigation, declare the marriage null. In that case, the contracting parties are free to marry, provided any natural obligations of the previous union, for example to children, are fulfilled. A decree of nullity is based on the lack of one or more necessary conditions at the beginning. Unlike a legal decree of divorce, which may be based on a condition that develops afterward. Now, when Adam and Eve fell, they ruptured the original communion between man and woman. Their relation became distorted by recriminations or blame, domination and lust. Their vocation to multiply and subdue the earth was burdened by the pain of childbirth and the toil of getting food. Ever since, marriage has been threatened by discord infidelity and jealousy. Accordingly, Moses permitted divorce. However, he wrote that commandment for you because of your stubbornness, Jesus said. Then, referring to marriage as it had been at the beginning of creation, he said, let no man separate what God has joined. To his apostles, who could hardly believe it, he made it even clearer. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And the woman who divorces her husband and marries another commits adultery. Though seriously disturbed, marriage's original nature persists. Spouses can achieve the union for which God created them, and they must never stop trying. Remember that union is supernatural. It's not just a feeling. God gives spouses all the help they need. The very consequences of the fall, pain in childbearing and toil in getting food, help them overcome self-absorption, egoism, and the pursuit of their own pleasure, and lead them to give themselves to each other and help each other. Now I've got the wrong page again. 191, Three. top of 191. Yeah, I seem to have been missing it. Right. Thank you. Through Give the me yours now, the pages. Okay. Through the sacrament of matrimony, Christ gives spouses strength to take up their crosses and follow him. Rise again after they have fallen. Bear with each other. Get rid of bitterness and malice. Forgive each other. Bear each other's burdens. Submit to each other out of reverence for Christ. Encourage each other. Build each other up. And love each other with supernatural, tender, and fruitful love. It can seem difficult, even impossible, to bind oneself for life to another human being. But that makes it all the more important for Christian spouses to witness to God's faithful and life-giving love by their own fidelity and fertility. Spouses who do so, often in very difficult conditions, deserve the gratitude and support of the church and society. The church requires that spouses administer the sacrament of matrimony to each other in church before a priest or a deacon, because it is a liturgical act connected with the Eucharist, for that is how Christ the Bridegroom gives himself to his bride, the Church. It is fitting, therefore, that matrimony be celebrated during Mass, where the new spouses show that they form one body in Christ by partaking of his body and blood. Thank you, Father. I'm just going to read footnote 147. It's so lovely. 
This comes from a document the Irish bishops put out many years ago now. They said, at the moment of Holy Com this is footnote 147, at the moment of Holy Communion, the priest or extraordinary minister of Holy Communion holds the body of Christ before the communicant and says, the body of Christ. The communicant answers, Amen. This means, yes. Yes, I believe it. Yes, I accept it. Yes, I accept the gift of your love and return it to you. I give you my body as you have given your body to me. A married couple finds in all this a very special added meaning. Each gives his or her body to the other in love. Each accepts the gift of the other's love and returns it to the married partner. Communion by the couple in the Eucharist is extended into every aspect of their communion of life together. Isn't that lovely? The title of that address was, or booklet is, uh, Love is for, for Life. life. It, was a, it was a beautiful, beautiful document. Beautiful pun. Yes. Mm -hmm. If anybody wants to borrow that, I don't know if you can find it online. We got the permission of the Irish bishops to, to, re to reprint it. it, and we can certainly give anybody who wants to read it a copy. So, the sacrament of matrimony, the enactment, the administration of the sacrament of matrimony is a liturgical act, should take place in church. Second, it puts the spouses into a new spiritual state of life with new rights and duties toward each other and their children about which the church has to be certain. And third, public consent helps guard against temptation to infidelity. The priest or deacon witnesses the consent of the spouse in the name of the church, bestows the church's blessing, and shows by his presence that matrimony is a spiritual reality. Again, once a sacramental marriage has been consummated, no power on earth can dissolve it. However, when one spouse dies, the survivor can remarry. The children of this age marry, Jesus said in answer to a question from the Sadducees, but those judged worthy of a place in the age to come and of resurrection from the dead do not. The gift is till death. Do us part. Jesus was rejecting the Sadducees' caricature of heaven, in which marriage was simply a continuation of the earthly relationship, said Cardinal Raniero Cantalamessa, who is preacher to the Pope's household. He was not implying that death puts an end to spousal communion, as if it will all be forgotten once we have crossed the threshold into eternal life. For those in Christ, the Cardinal noted, Life is changed by death, not ended. In heaven, matrimony, which is one response to our vocation to love, will be transfigured, not nullified. We cannot imagine transfigured marriage. Any more than a young boy can imagine earthly marriage. The most intense pleasure the boy knows comes from chocolate. Told that eating chocolate is not part of marital pleasure, he begins to characterize marriage as fasting from chocolate. He is familiar with chocolate. He cannot even begin to imagine a pleasure that excludes it. Similarly, we, this, did I say that? This image comes from C.S. Lewis. Similarly, we know the pleasure of earthly marriage. We do not yet know the bliss of the wedding day of the Lamb, which in heaven will overwhelm the earthly pleasure as an incoming wave overwhelms the spent outgoing wave. Flesh and blood, in the scriptural sense of human weakness, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But flesh and blood made glorious by their link with Christ's flesh and blood do inherit the kingdom. The church affirms the true resurrection of this flesh, male or female, that we now possess. But that's all we know. In the great divorce, Lewis imagines that the lizard of sexual appetite, once mastered, is transfigured as a magnificent stallion. 
To see how marriage is transfigured, we must wait for the renewal of all things at the end of time. Now, marriage with a non-Catholic. First of all, the advice of St. Paul. Do not yoke yourselves in a mismatch with unbelievers. What fellowship can light have with darkness? The difficulties of marriage with a non-Catholic must not be underestimated. Differences of belief can tempt spouses to religious indifference and lead to tension, especially in educating children. Accordingly, the, the, the Church requires a Catholic who wants to marry a non-Catholic to apply to the bishop for permission or even a dispensation. First of all, with an unbaptized person. The Church's expectation is that when Catholics marry, their marriages will be sacramental. That means that both parties must be baptized, for only baptized people can receive a sacrament. Therefore, before a Catholic can contract a valid marriage with an unbaptized person, he must be dispensed from fulfilling the church's expectation. The bishop normally grants this dispensation provided the Catholic declares formally that his faith will not be endangered and promises to do all he can to have the children baptized and brought up Catholic. The unbaptized person is told about the declaration and the promise beforehand so that he is aware of the obligations they entail and both parties are instructed about the nature and purpose of marriage. However, even if the bishop grants the dispensation and the marriage takes place in a Catholic church, it is not sacramental. In such a marriage, the Catholic spouse has a special task, for the unbelieving husband is consecrated by his believing wife, and the unbelieving wife by her believing husband. That's from St. Paul. If the unbaptized spouse is converted and baptized, the marriage automatically becomes sacramental at the time of the baptism. I remember, I can't remember which parish you were in, Father, but um, on the first Sunday of Lent, the Archbishop normally administers, that's not the word, celebrates the right of election, which means the right of choosing those who are to be baptized. That's R-I-T-E, not R-I-G-H-T. Um, and then he meets the people afterwards. Usually it takes place at Holy Rosary Cathedral. And I remember one year, do you remember? We had four couples taking the course. In each couple, one was already Catholic. The other was not even baptized. And so we had pointed out to them that at the time of the baptism, the marriage would automatically become sacramental. So um, I mentioned this to the, to the bishop, and he said, oh, so you're going to receive three sacraments. No, four. Baptism, confirmation, the Holy Eucharist, and matrimony. With a baptized non-Catholic, things are different. Baptism in other Christian denomination is valid. So the marriage of a Catholic with a baptized non-Catholic is sacramental. However, the bishop must grant his permission, which he normally does under the conditions listed above. Again, once a sacramental marriage has been consummated, no power on earth can dissolve it, for it brings into being between the spouses the indissoluble covenant between Christ and his church. Legal divorce cannot break that covenant, but it does injure it. Any new union adds to the gravity of the injury, for it constitutes public, ongoing adultery. Divorce disturbs the order of the family and society, harms the deserted spouse, and traumatizes children. Do you remember, you know who I mean, a couple who had decided to buy their daughter, their only child, a very expensive cat. And it was going to be so expensive that it would constitute her birthday present and her Christmas present, so she wasn't to expect two. So they sat her down after dinner one night to 
talk to her seriously about this. And before they could explain, she said, I know what you're going to tell me. You're getting a divorce. They said, my goodness, no. It turned out all her friends were going through this trauma. And they had to reassure her. Yeah, so sad. Oh, I don't know what she'd been through before she got the courage to say it. It traumatizes children. It is contagious. Truly a plague in our society. Thanks be to God that couple, by the way, are still together. Still together after. And their daughters must be 27, very nice. yes. 28 years, yeah. Yes. Divorce is, it is seriously wrong for a spouse to abandon a valid marriage, even if no new union is contracted. However, no wrong is committed by a spouse who tries to be faithful, but is unjustly abandoned or unwillingly divorced. If, as a matter of fact, it becomes impossible for spouses to live together, the church lets them se separate and live apart. She even tolerates divorce if it is necessary to ensure personal safety, the care of children, or legal rights. However, divorce does not dissolve the union before God, and the spouses are not free to contract new unions. The best solution is still reconciliation, if possible. Divorced Catholics who do contract new unions cannot receive communion until they have repented their sin in the sacrament of penance and committed themselves to complete continence. However, even before repentance, the Church shows them attentive solicitude so that they will not feel completely cut off but will continue to pray, do penance, ask for God's grace, attend Mass, hear God's word, work for charity and justice, and bring up their children as Catholics. Hence, and, you get situations where people are living in that situation, but they'll come forward for a blessing, yeah. asking God to help them. And that's what Pope Francis and the um, Congregation for the Dicastery, rather, for the uh, Doctrine of the Faith, have recently done their best to clarify. Yes, the church still shows couples in irregular situations attentive solicitude so that they will not feel completely cut off. Hence they come into the confessional even saying, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I need help. We all do. Yes. Then the question of infertility. God, wanting to associate man and woman in his creative work, told Adam and Eve to be fertile and multiply. One of the purposes of marriage, therefore, is the procreation and education of children. However, a child is not an object to which spouses have a right. He is a gift from God and a living testimony of the mutual giving of his parents. He has the right to be the fruit of the specific act of the conjugal love of his parents. Even when procreation is impossible, conjugal life retains its value and meaning. For the sacrament of matrimony not only increases the human family, but also brings about the spiritual reality it signifies, namely the increase of God's family. In a special way, infertile spouses can share the Lord's cross, the source of all spiritual fruitfulness. By services such as adoption, education, assistance to other families, and help to poor or handicapped children. You might like to read, it's very lovely, footnote 191, in which, um, oh, it's that book that we edited. The author of it analyzed adoption, saying how much this is God's um, way of doing things, how we are all his adopted children. It's very lovely. To conclude then, marriage is part of bios, the life of mortals. However, bios is only a faint shadow of zoe, the life of God. For the baptized, authentic married love is caught up into divine love, and marriage becomes matrimony an efficacious sign of the covenant and communion between Christ and his church. 
Before matrimony, a man may say, I am going to marry her because I love her, referring to the natural love we call eros. After matrimony, he can say, I love her because I married her, referring to the supernatural love of Christ for his church. And of course, that paragraph could be put the other way. Spouses may say, we are going to be married because we love each other, referring to the natural love we call eros. After matrimony, they can say they love each other because they are married, referring to the supernatural love between Christ and his church. Mm. Yes. Now, a couple of appendices, the first one we've already talked about, really a very charming story, Johnny Lingo's Eight Cow Wife. And the second one, shared responsibility in decision-making. Decision-making is not just choosing. There are five important elements to it in which there is power and influence in each one of them. That goes on for a, a few pages. So what are we reading, Father? One of the week? books on the bibliography is uh, um, oh, right. Human Sexuality. It's Christian Meaning. It's a book which we have rewritten um, to clarify some areas of difference and, dis and um, misunderstanding. Very but, much editing, though, rather than... Yes, yeah. but uh, Human Sexuality, it's Christian Meaning. Show the dignity and the wonder of God's gifts to us and who we are and what we are. In the... Um, so we've referred you to that book in a few of the footnotes. If anybody wants a copy, $10 will cover the book and the cost of mailing it to you. Our contact information is in the very front of the binder in the introduction. Um, I should have also, Father, mentioned a couple of other books in um, bibliography. the bibliography. Laura Doyle. The Surrendered Wife, accompanied by the Catholic preface. This is the one I spoke of where she found out, not by any references to the Bible or the church, but simply in her own experience, what St. Paul had said, frankly. Yeah. Um, Mary Healy, Men and Women Are from Eden. This is a, it's based very much on Pope John Paul's Theology of the Body, but much easier to understand. The Irish Bishop's Love is for Life. I think the only place to find that now is us. from us. Again, write to us. We can send you a copy. We can even email you a copy of that one. Uh, and then Sheldon Van Orkins. Sorry, Father. I forgot to say Okay. Line. With regards to the reading, the scripture reading for this coming week, um, continuing in the book of Jeremiah, you'll see... Um, um, the meaning is clear. The wages of sin are death. Sinful cities are destroyed and people put to the sword. Nevertheless, death is not the end of the story. God is merciful. So next week we will be talking about death and the end of the world. We will see how death leads to endless day, as the church says in her night prayers. And in the meantime, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank Good. you, Father.